Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are gathering this morning to consider S-348, an act relating to temporary elections procedures in the year 2020. Uh, this is uh, maybe our second lap on this issue. And uh, so we will, uh, we will try to dive right into hearing um, thoughts from a bunch of witnesses. But before we do that, I think I will go to Betsy Ann and Betsy Ann ask you to uh, take us on a jog through this relatively straightforward bill. Sounds good. Good morning, everybody. Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council, walking through with you S-348 as passed by Senate. Thanks for to Andrea for posting this. There are two parts of this bill. Um, the bill is introduced would do what you see on the first page and as passed the Senate would do this also. Um, the first part of this bill would amend your 2020 Acts and Resolves number 92. That had that was the first GovOps uh, COVID related bill and specifically section three, which is in regard to uh, the Secretary of State being authorized in consultation and agreement with the governor to order or permit appropriate elections procedures. And then it provided a non-exhaustive list of what those temporary elections procedures could be um, to address COVID. And the Senate, then the bill is introduced, struck the requirement for the Secretary of State to obtain the agreement of the governor. So that's why that language on page one in subsection A would strike and agreement, maintaining the requirement for the Secretary of State to consult with the governor in ordering or permitting these temporary elections procedures. On the floor of the Senate, there was an amendment that was proposed and that amendment had three different parts, um, three instances of amendment. Um, they were all pretty much related, but um, the Senate considered them in separate instances of amendment, one, two, and three. Um, just as an FYI, the first instance of amendment would have struck the requirement for the Secretary of State to consult with the governor also. That amendment failed. So you'll see consultation is still required. The second instance of amendment is what the Senate did adopt, and that is on page two to add this subsection C. This language provides that if the Secretary of State orders or permits the mailing of 2020 general election ballots to all registered voters pursuant to that subsection A authority, the governor or the secretary of state would need to do two things. First, inform the governor as soon as reasonably practicable following the secretary's decision to mail out those ballots. And I read or I understood C1 to somewhat be related to that uh, first instance of amendment that would have struck the consultation. So in lieu of consultation, there would just be an informing of the governor. Um, but this C1, the Senate did adopt. And in addition, as part of the second instance of amendment, there's also this language here in C2 that reads that if the secretary orders or permits the mailing of 2020 general election ballots to all registered voters, the secretary would be required to return those to require the return of those ballots to be in the manner prescribed by 17 VSA 2543, which is in regard to the return of early voter absentee ballots, quote, as set forth in SEC one of this act, the provisions of which shall reply to that return. Well, there you'll see there is no SEC 1A. Um, SEC 1A was in the third instance of amendment. So that third instance of amendment failed. Um, the third instance of amendment would have added SEC A to amend 17 VSA 2543, which is in regard to the return of early voter absentee ballots. And in that 2543, the language uh, provides how early voter absentee ballots needed to be returned. The third instance of amendment would have amended that statutory law um, to put parameters on who could return those ballots. And just as an FYI, the who would be the voter himself or herself, the justices of the peace that uh, deliver the ballot if applicable, or an authorized family member or authorized caregiver, and then provided penalties for someone who was not authorized and returned a ballot um, without the voter's authorization. 
but that SEC 1A failed. Um, so we are left with this language um, referring to a SEC 1A that isn't in there now. Um, but with this language, um, at a minimum, if, the, if this language were to pass as is, um, and the Secretary of State does decide to uh, order or permit the mailing of 2020 general election ballots, um, the Secretary of State would need to inform the governor um, as soon as reasonably practical following the Secretary's decision to do so. Still effective on passage. Uh, Warren has a question. Warren, go ahead and unmute yourself. I have more a comment than a, than a question really, but I was glad to see that they have amended that to remove the and agreement language. I, I hope you remember that I spoke against that a while back because it, it just shifted the responsibility. Uh, the Secretary of State's office has always had the exclusive responsibility to set election rules. Uh, and by allowing the governor in into that mix by allowing by requiring the secretary of state to get agreement from the governor that just gives the governor veto power over whatever the secretary of state was proposing to do and uh i thought that was that was a serious mistake and as it's playing out the, gov the governor was uh, refusing to go along with what the secretary of state wanted to do so i'm glad to see that they removed that uh, but this, this has always been the Secretary of State's exclusive responsibility, and I think it should remain that way. We have, we have capable people in both the administration and the Secretary of State's office, and it shouldn't have to be joint between them. Uh, it should be just, it's been the Secretary of State, it should always stay that way. That's my comment, so I hope we agree with that new language. That's my point, thank you. Thanks, Warren. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Betsy Ann, um, going down to the language in C2, um, I, have, I have two questions. My first question is, wouldn't when, when 17 VSA 2543 apply no matter what? So you should hear from the Secretary of State's office. I, I would think that 2543 would apply, or at least it would be the baseline to operate from because if the Secretary of State does bail out 2020 general election ballots, those would seem to be an early voter absentee ballot. Um, and so that statute would seem to apply, but um, the Secretary of State also has the authority to uh, order or permit temporary elections procedures. So unless the General Assembly explicitly requires 2543 to apply, then I would read the secretary's authority under subsection A to be able to deviate from 2543 if the secretary of state thought it necessary to conform with the temporary elections procedures that the secretary orders. Okay, thanks. Um, and my second question is with respect to as set forth in section 1A, do we need to clean that up? I would recommend it be cleaned up. Um, this is your call, but there is no set 1A and I can see how the language would cause confusion. I read it as 25, 17 BSA 2543 as it would have been amended in SEC 1A, um, but that didn't happen because there is no SEC 1A. So I do think this reference to SEC 1A that really doesn't have any meaning from a drafting perspective, it causes confusion. Um, and so that would be nice if it could be clarified, but that's up to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim Harrison. Thank you, um, Betsy Ann. Um, first, more of a comment in reference to my friend from Montpelier. Um, the Secretary of State's office does not write election law. Um, the election law is written by 108. I mean, we pass laws governing elections. The Secretary of State's office administers elections. Uh, we're taking a quite a leap here, which is why I supported putting in 
the governor language before. Um, having said that, uh, this is a question for Betsy Ann. Do we need in consultation? Um, they've already consulted. They've already done that. They've gone back and forth, couldn't reach agreement. Um, do we even need in consultation at this point in time? I mean, why don't we just make it cleaner if, if that's the direction we're going to go? I think that's a policy decision for you to make. The Senate had that same conversation um, about whether to remove that. Uh, the Senate GovOps Committee in introducing this bill agreed to maintain the consultation requirement. Okay, and then the other question, um, just to follow up um, from the member from Wilmington, um, I, I, I'm, I'm confused if we leave section 1A in there uh, and we don't add anything further, or even if we yeah, if we leave it there, would um, a reasonable interpretation that existing law would hold in that ballots can be returned by any person, or does the Secretary of State have the ability to um, change that? Are you asking me or? Yeah, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so remember yes, the over lawyer. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> remember the overall authority in subsection A is the ability of, as it's currently written, uh, the Secretary of State to order or permit appropriate elections procedures. It's a general authority. Um, and so if the Secretary of State decides to mail out 2020 general election ballots. I read that general authority in subsection A, including the authority to order how those ballots would be returned. Okay. And would they have to do that by rule or regulation or can they do it by printing a notice on the envelope? So it's the order authority. The general assembly did not require this to be by rule. Um, it's the secretary of state order. Um, it's not the same as, but I would liken it to um, some of the governor's executive orders um, in this, this, during this COVID emergency situation. It's not done by rule, um, but the governor has authority by laws enacted by the General Assembly to um, issue these orders that uh, the governor has been making during this emergency time. And so I would liken this Secretary of State authority to that authority. It's the General Assembly saying that the Secretary of State may order these without the rulemaking process being necessary um, in order to address the elections due to COVID in this emergency situation. All right, you are muted again. I guess that's your last question. Um, so Rob LeClaire has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess it's kind of a question, kind of statement to, to follow up from my um, left-leaning committee member from Montpelier's comment. Um, if the governor, if if the governor is going to be taken out of this, and I think he should be taken out of it totally. I agree that the Secretary of State is the primary election officer here, and to keep this. Uh, much simpler and much cleaner. My feeling is I'd like to see us take the governor out of it totally. No consultation doesn't even have to be informed about it. Why, if, if he isn't gonna be able to have any input into it, then why have any, any role to play at all? Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, anybody else have questions? Mike Marwicki. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, there's been a lot of conjecture about what the governor wants and what he doesn't want. And, uh, you know, this, this committee helped put this clause in there so the governor could be consulted, even though I'm not sure they asked for it. And it seems to me that the governor has said he doesn't want to be part of this. I, I'm not sure what I'm, I'm not sure of anything about this right now. And my suggestion is we call the governor to testify himself so we can hear exactly what he wants in this instance. That's a, that's a, 
a valid point. I I will take your point. I'm not sure that we're going to get him on the horn this morning, but uh, but we have the Secretary of State, so that's going to be the next best thing. Um, so I am going to throw it over to you, Jim, and invite you to share with us your thoughts on S348, um, and uh, and then we'll go on from there. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I do want to take thank you all for taking this up today. And I, I apologize for my being brief, but I do have another meeting that has been long scheduled uh, in a few minutes. But let me be very clear. It is our hope that this remains a clean bill. And in fact, we would ask that you just concur with the Senate because time is of the essence. The bill is really about one thing, just removing the governor from the from the decision-making process. The governor has stated to me personally, and he's also stated it in several of his press, press conferences, that he's not philosophically opposed to vote by mail. He defers to me and my team as experts in elections. He does not believe the voter fraud narrative. He, Dr. Levine and Dr. Fauci have stated, we need to expect a surge of, of the virus in the fall. He even stated that he, that. Uh, the governor has even stated that even in August, when he wants to make this decision, they'll not be able to predict uh, what's going to happen in September, or October. Our problem uh, at the elections office is that if this were to happen at the end of September or mid October, we're up a creek without a paddle, uh, and it's going to be really be a problem of, of disenfranchising of, of voters. Uh, he further said, and he has said this publicly, that he didn't ask to be put in this position, he didn't want to be put in this position, and that he does not stand in the way of the legislature if they remove him. So let's go back to a little bit of the background. Uh, when, the, when the emergency COVID bill started back in March, it was to provide authority for me as Secretary of State and Vermont's Chief Election Officer, the, the flexibility to move quickly while this virus was in play. Um, a member of this committee, as you know, offered an amendment and we agreed to it in the interest of expediency. We were trying to get this through before, before any kind of shutdown that may have, ha may have occurred. At the time, you will remember, it wasn't sure how the legislature was going to continue going forward. However, to put it simply, the governor and I have had discussions, uh, his team and my team and myself and the governor, for about eight weeks now and with no resolution. He agrees with almost everything we've proposed, but he does not wanna pull the trigger until after the August primary. He has asked us to go ahead and start putting all the, the infrastructure in place and do the things we need to do, which will between now and then cost us approximately a million to a million and a half dollars. Uh, and, and then he'll, he said, we can decide at that time. My problem is we can't wait. We have to move forward. Uh, and my real concern is if we spend a million to a million and a half dollars, even though it's federal dollars, that it's still, that we would still be subject to a federal audit and that money could be clawed back by, by, uh, by, the, uh, by the feds. Um, so what's this about? Protecting our democracy through our elections. The COVID-19 health crisis has challenged many aspects of our society and our lives, from our Main Street businesses, to our healthcare facilities, to our homes. Vermont elections are not immune. Personally, I love going to the polling place on election day. Seeing friends, family members, and neighbors all doing our civic duty by voting is something that's truly special to me. And I know many of us share a great deal of pride and enjoyment in that process. As Vermont's chief election official and entrusted guardian of that process, I am responsible for making sure our free, fair and free elections can be conducted safely, despite the presence of a highly contagious virus disrupting our normal everyday activities. As a state and a country, we are facing a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the weeks and months ahead. The medical experts, including Dr. Fauci and, and Dr. Levine here in Vermont have said, there's no way to predict with certainty the status of the virus in the fall. Many are anticipating that second surge, as I said earlier, 
although we are unsure what the extent will be. Fair and free elections are the very foundation of our democracy. The right to vote is not only a sacred right, it is a right enshrined in both our Vermont and US constitutions, guaranteeing that right to every American citizen. So to end, I will just say that preserving our right, right to vote while protecting the health of every Vermont voter, town clerk, and poll worker at the polls is my number one priority. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I, I will let uh, Chris and Will follow up with uh, questions and about process and details uh, <laughs> as we go. So it, um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, Secretary Condos, uh, Jim Harrison has his hand up. Do you have time to stick around for a question? Sure. All right, go ahead, Jim. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, it was also a pleasure talking to you yesterday. Um, can you um, share with us what the plan is via, assuming we give you this authority to uh, adopt directives on election law this fall, what your directive will say about return of ballots. Right now, as you know, under existing law, basically ballots can come back by any means possible. Um, do you envision changing that? And if so, how, um, how will you change it? So, the plan, first of all, let me let me be clear about what the plan is. The plan is for the primary, we are not going to make any changes to the process of the, of the elections. The only thing we are doing in addition is to mail out a postcard, a uh, prepaid postcard to every active registered voter uh, as to whether they want a, a, a mail-in ballot, a, a direct mail ballot uh, for the primary. That's by design. Uh, it also helps us clean up our checklist even more so. And I, I do want to say, state very clearly at this point, Representative Harrison, that, that our voter checklist today, because there's been a lot of stuff out there, a lot of rhetoric in the, in the press uh, from individuals, our voter checklist today is far more accurate than it was yesterday, the day before that, and the day before that. We instituted or implemented a new voter checklist system in 2015, which was state of the art. We did a tremendous amount of, of cleanup of the, of the checklist at that time, working with the town clerks. Uh, there is, and now for three years, we've had the uh, automatic voter registration where we get an upload from DMV every night, and that helps us maintain correct addresses and make changes as needed. So our checklist is in much better shape. Now, going forward into the general election, there's only one aspect of the general election process that we envision changing at this time. And that is the direct mail of a ballot to every uh, registered, active registered voter. Um, that is it. Everything else about the process will be the same. Um, and we will uh, perhaps have minor details in, involved in that, that as we, put this thing together, we haven't got the final final effort uh, written down as far as what we plan to do, but there is a lot that has to be done between now and, and our August as we prepare for this. Um, so the answer to your question is, I am certainly willing to look at uh, making some, uh, adding to the directive uh, language about uh, the return of ballots, but I don't really see the need right now for that. Uh, although I do think uh, that, that, you know, I can certainly, um, you know, I, I would be consulting with the governor anyway, whatever we decide to do, we're going to send it to the governor to let him know. Um, but, you know, you're asking about a, a, an underlying change. And, and I think that it's a, uh, not a good idea to have this debate in a very short amount of time uh, going forward. We've had that law in place for years, the current law. We've never had a problem under the current law. There are uh, aspects of the law as far as influencing voters, uh, uh, the 
impersonating another voter, uh, all these things. You sign the envelope in, uh, under pe uh, penalty of perjury. Um, there's a lot of things in place already. And this, I, what, what you're asking me is whether we're willing to basically do a double whammy uh, on the voter. Um, so if I could pick up on that, and I understand that you haven't reached agreement totally with the governor. Um, but I'm looking at a memo um, under your name that I assume was an outline of what the uh, directive was going to say for the 2020 elections. And it says in here, for the primary election on August 11th and the November general election on November 3rd, all early absentee ballots must be returned to the clerk of the town or city in which the voter is registered to vote by either the voter or an immediate family member. Are you backtracking from that language that is written in this memo? Uh, are you referring to a memo I sent to the governor? Yes. Okay, so uh, in a sense, I'm not really backtracking, but that was an immediate, an initial uh, attempt to have a discussion with the governor about a directive. And after we sent that over to him in our office, we realized that that was too restrictive and would, would not allow uh, people to uh, be able to get their ballots back. The, the question here, we are planning to pay the postage, the return postage for every ballot that we send out. So we do not believe that there will be a whole lot of this to happen. We're also going to provide the towns with uh, lock boxes so that they can have a, a drop box so that people can return their ballots if they want to bring it right to, to, the, uh, um, to the town clerk's office. There will be ample opportunities for people to get those back. We do not see this as an issue. However, we will probably issue some kind of uh, restrictive language, but it won't be overly restrictive. There, there are many cases out there, Representative Harrison. We had uh, a situation where a, uh, a, a someone whose neighbor is an elderly person and stays home, uh, they are not a caregiver. They do not provide care. All they do is they look in on their neighbor once in a while, and they assist in taking the ballot back to the, to the town clerk. Once the town, once the voter has filled out their ballot, put it in that envelope, sealed that envelope, signed that envelope, there's not really a problem uh, going forward. I disagree on that because it's, uh, and you can be selective in that, but that's maybe an argument for another day. Um, I, I appreciate your candidness, uh, Secretary, and, uh, you know, I, I would love to work with you on, on tightening this up, but I, I guess I'm disappointed that you're backing away from an earlier proposal, um, and, and I understand maybe it was part of discussion, but I also saw a similar comment in a Digger article last week um, where it sort of suggested that um, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth that you were okay with um, the tightening of the return, uh, similar to language that's, just, that's in the memo that I'm looking at. So here's here's the point I guess I would make is, first of all, as I said earlier, uh, Representative Harrison, uh, this underlying law has been in place for decades and we've never had a problem. We've never seen a problem. Uh, and, and I understand, I, I guess I would ask you, what is, what is the concern? Uh, because we are not seeing that concern. We are not seeing anything happen. You know, you have laws in place for speeding on the highway, uh, you know, yet people still do. I understand that, but you don't have, we don't, we don't make, uh, put in governors into every car to limit them to a certain speed. So, I guess I'm not I'm not really understanding exactly what what you're getting at because we've never seen a problem. Are you suggesting that there will be a problem this year? 
Um, God, I hope not. Um, and I'm not suggesting there will necessarily be a problem. However, we are making a fundamental shift in the way we conduct elections if we go to all mail balloting. And I think it's reasonable for this one time to have some bumper guards on who can return ballots. Normally, when we do early balloting, and I've done early voting myself, that oftentimes it's going down to the town clerk's office, asking for an early ballot and filling it out right then and there because you're going to be away on election day. Um, and others that you mail, um, the clerk knows who they're mailed to, can flag the return, but oftentimes when someone requests a mail ballot, they turn it around way to way. Again, for a variety of personal reasons, they're going on a trip, they are having surgery, whatever. Um, we, Vermont has a very open early voting system, but it's something that you have to request. So given that we're going to a all new system with mailing a ballot to those who don't request them, um, I think it's reasonable to require some bumper guards. And the language that we're talking about is very typical to language that is in uh, a number of other states, if not most other states. So um, Representative Harrison, I guess I would just continue to add that it's already illegal to commit fraud in, as a voter. Uh, it's already illegal to influence another voter. It's already illegal to um, um, essentially get in the way uh, and, and obstruct a voter. So I, I guess I don't know why we would need, at least from my standpoint, even if you pass this, as, as uh, uh, Betsy Ann has already explained, I could still change it. So I'm not sure that it's necessary to do that at this time. I do think, and I will say this to you right now, I do think that this, that this section of the law, we could take a look at it, but I think this is a, an improper time to do that uh, because we do not have an issue going forward. Now, having said that, I will. I noticed that uh, 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 one of the town clerks is on uh, is on uh, uh, on this call, and I think Carol Dawes is is there. So perhaps she can explain a little bit more about the return of ballots and the concerns, uh, and, and maybe alleviate some of your concerns, uh, since she comes from one of the larger cities in in the state. So. Um, but in any case, I, I just think that it's, it's not necessary to do at this time. Uh, and I do want to correct one thing you said. You, you said all mail balloting, uh, all mail voting. This is not necessary. We're not going to a universal system that requires you to mail it back. We are going to a system where we will mail the ballot out to every active registered voter. But the voter has the option of mailing it back has the option of walking it into their town clerk's office, has the op option of walking into the polling location with their ballot, or if they haven't voted uh, on, on that ballot that was mailed to them, they can walk into the polling place and vote at, at the polling place. The only aspect of the voting process for November that we're proposing, the only aspect is that we will mail the ballot directly to every voter. And it's in a secure way. Uh, we will know, we have identifying marks on the envelope, the certificate envelope coming back. We will know you sign that envelope under pe pe uh, penalty of perjury. Um, and and I, just, I, I just think that we're arguing about something that, that's not necessary. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, um, Mr. Secretary, however, um, harvesting of ballots, even though they're sealed, signed, and there's nothing wrong with the ballot themselves, uh, open up to potential issues uh, with harvesting. Um, we all know people in our neighborhoods that are not going to vote for us regardless. So if I were so inclined, and I'm certainly not, I've never returned someone else's ballot, um, I would not offer to pick up ballots from 
my neighbors that I know are not going to vote for me. Um, so you can end up making phone calls to your supporters the night before the election, one step further by actually trying to collect ballots. So I'm interested in putting something in place in this unique instance where everyone's going to get a ballot at home. And I didn't mean to apply that it's all male voting, it's all male uh, ballots uh, sending out. Um, so I, I understand the difference. Um, I, I'm interested in preventing any type of harvesting of ballots that might work to your favor. And I don't mean there's an interest group that's uh, interested in certain candidates, but not others. Thank you. Rob LeClaire and then Mike Merwicki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Secretary of State. Good How are morning. you? Um, as you know, we had an election in Barry Town very recently. A um, couple questions I have for you. One is, um, since the election, we've gotten 20 ballots back after the election, and I know at least 10 of them were postmarked before the election. The other 10, I don't know yet. I haven't confirmed that, but how do you anticipate us dealing with that, with the mail-in um, because oh yeah, as we all know, you can't rest assured that you can get a letter from Montpelier to Barry overnight. And I'm concerned about a lot of ballots not getting counted. And secondly, um, I agree with you. I'd like to give you as clean of a bill as we can give you. Would you have any concern about just taking the governor totally out of this equation whatsoever? Any reference to him at all? Just remove it so that it's totally your call. So let me take the second one first. Um, and I would say that, uh, no, I don't have any concern about that, except the only concern I have is that if to do that, that means you have to send it back to the, uh, to the Senate for their review again. Uh, and it just delays this process a, a little bit more. Uh, so that's just, that's, let me just say that right there. Um, we are looking, at, and to your first point, um, yes, we, we are seriously considering right now, state law says that the ballot has to be received by 7 p.m. on election night. And that's, that's, that's what the law says. We are looking at the possibility, and this would be part of our directive if we did it, um, and it's a serious consideration, uh, of extending the receipt of ballots to Friday, in other words, extending it by three days to allow for ballots that are postmarked on election day to be received and counted. Uh, corresponding to that, we would have to extend the uh, canvas from the Tuesday, seven days after the election. In other words, the Tuesday after the election, we would have to extend that deadline to the Friday as well. So that we still maintain that seven day period for the town clerks to certify their elections and get that information to our office. Very good. Thank you, Jim, or Mr. Secretary. Mike Merwicki. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Secretary, I, I'm not here to question you and uh, I'm, I'm here. So if, if anyone else has questions for you, they should probably go ahead, but I'm, I'm ready to let you go. And, and we have a long list of, of witnesses we also want to hear from. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, um, I'm cognizant that we do have a long list of uh, witnesses we want to hear, and uh, I, I want to hear all of them. So I just want to, I know we're on the floor at 11, as, as Zoom goes, but I hope that we can make the commitment to stick with this process all day long if we have to, to hear all the questions and all the witnesses. Um, even though I'm ready to vote right now to concur with the Senate, I want the process to unfold. So I hope we can make that commitment that we will stay here all day and into the night if we have to, to hear all that needs to be, all, all those who wanna be heard on this. Absolutely. Um, this, is, uh, this is a priority for, our, for the committee to work on. Um, and we do have floor at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, but I will ask leave of 
the speaker to be late to the floor of the house if need be so that we can finish hearing from all of our witnesses. I believe, Jim, that you said Deputy Secretary Winters would like to speak for a few moments. I think he would, uh, and Will is there to assist him if there's any details of uh, uh, that need to be hashed out. Um, I, I thank the, Again, I want to thank the committee for their attention to this. Uh, this is really important to me, but also to our elections team, which, by the way, is the smallest elections team in the country. Uh, but we also have very hardworking town clerks uh, whose main focus is the integrity of our elections, and they should be commended as well. So thank you very much. I would also urge you, I know Carol Dawes was on. I'm not sure if she still is, but if she is, I would urge you to hear from her as a town clerk as well. Absolutely. That is our plan. Thank you. Uh, Chris, take it away. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. And if my internet lags here at all, I'm going to cut video. I'm competing with a fourth grade math class right now. Um, I appreciate that the, that the committee is uh, hearing this issue again. I really want to thank you for your, your patience with us and for giving your valuable time to this issue and making it a priority. Uh, building on what Secretary Condos just said, and I will be brief here, our, our goal is to make certain every Vermonter has the ability to vote safely in what is going to be a high turnout election this November. And you've heard many times before from, from me, from Secretary Condos, from uh, Director Will Senning and others, we have to plan for this now, even though the election is, is, is months away and there's still a great deal of uncertainty around what the coming months are gonna bring. And, and I hope the conversation keeps turning back to the health and safety of Vermonters because we do not have the luxury of waiting any longer for a decision. Our goal has always been to be as prepared as, as we can for the, the worst case scenario. Uh, the virus is still going to be with us in November. We don't know what form it will be in, but. The experts are predicting a resurgence and we need to listen to that. And we need to do right now what we can to allow Vermonters to safely exercise their right to vote. And the best and most effective way to do that in our view is to drive down in-person voting at polling places to protect Vermonters, to protect election officials and to protect poll workers. And we're seeing it play out before our eyes right now in other states. We're seeing some of these primary elections happening and the struggles that they're ha having with voting in person and voting by um, absentee ballot requests. The, the problems with uh, getting those requests out, the problems with getting ballots back as Representative Le LeClaire pointed out, our plan to mail every active registered voter a ballot in November would eliminate a lot of those problems and it's a safeguard, it's an insurance policy. So the best way and most effective way to drive down polling place attendance is to put a ballot uh, in front of every active registered voter and allow them to choose how they want to vote. They'll have the ability to vote in person if they want, to vote early, to drop off their ballots or to mail them in. Uh, many, many Vermont voters already choose to vote by mail. 30% of Vermonters in the 2016 election either voted early or voted by mail. This is really nothing new. Several other states do this without a problem, so we need to stay focused on the real issues here, which I think is the health and safety of Vermonters and avoiding any disenfranchisement of people who might be afraid to come out and vote in person in November or shouldn't be coming out to vote in person in November if the health pandemic continues. But as we keep on saying, we need a clear path forward now. We can't stress enough how difficult it is to do this work without a clear directive. It's a really heavy lift. Um, Will Senning is here and can talk to you about some of the mechanics of getting that done. It's a complicated endeavor and it's not like we can just flip a switch after the primary. So we thank you for passing Act 92 and giving us some time to try to reach an agreement with the governor and his team. We've really been trying hard to get the assurances we need, but that just has not materialized. Try as we might to make that happen. So at the end of the day, what we really need quite simply is clarity and certainty, and we still don't have that. So up until now, we've been hoping to get a decision from the administration to go ahead with the amount of assurance that we need, but 
Um, the goalposts have shifted a few times and our latest proposal for a decision now with an off ramp decided by the governor and secretary of state in August was rejected. Uh, so if we can't get a clear path forward, then we need uh, a plan and, and we really do need a plan to be prepared. We, we understand that you as a legislature would feel obligated to do something. Uh, and as Secretary Kondo stated, the governor has in fact invited you to do just that and has said that he never asked to be involved and never wanted to be a part of this decision. So we need certainty as soon as possible before we make many more, too many more critical decisions, um, enter into more contracts or invest more resources. So we really do thank you for taking this up now. Will Senning is here and would be glad to answer your questions about the mechanics and what he's been able to put in place already and why acting right now is so important. He's been working nonstop on this to do what he can without a decision to get us ready for every eventuality we may face in the fall. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I really appreciate the time with the committee and I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, the testimony of the other folks that you have here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Rob LeClaire has a question and, um, and I guess I just wanna suggest that uh, since we've been around this, if this issue a few times let's try not to ask questions that we've already uh, that we've already um, asked and and had answered for us uh, because we do have several other witnesses who I think can also um, inform this conversation in uh, in a new way so Rob go ahead okay thank you madam chair I'll try to make it brief here um, good morning mr. deputy secretary of state um, I just want to clarify did I hear you say that you're planning to have the ability to vote in person in the November election as an option as well? Absolutely. And that's something that I think has been getting missed in some of these conversations. This is not a mandatory vote by mail. There will still and always has been a plan to have in-person voting available for, especially for the people who don't, uh, for, for which voting by mail might not be an option for them. So I'm, so you're, um, doesn't that seem to make it even more confusing? It seems to me it should be one or the other, because if you're going to send out ballots to everybody, um, then why should they have to come in and vote in person, especially if we're concerned about this COVID resurgence? Um, doesn't it going to make it more confusing for the town clerks that somebody theoretically could vote twice? because you're gonna get one home by mail and then you still would have the option to go in and vote in person, wouldn't you? Your, your vote is only checked off once on the checklist by the town clerk. So if you were to vote by mail and then show up at your polling place, you'd already be checked off. Okay. Um, there, there, we, we think there would actually be a, a, a certain amount of disenfranchisement and probably some lawsuits if we didn't at least make voting in person possible we are right. if if there's a uh, if there's a resurgence in the fall, we are going to be pushing like crazy for people to vote by mail and not come into the polling place to keep those numbers down to keep our uh, voters and our election workers, our poll workers safe. Um, but you know, there will be some people who really are going to refuse to vote by mail. Maybe maybe they want to vote in person, uh, sure. but our goal is to drive down those numbers at the polling places as much as possible. And the best way to do that is to put a ballot on everybody's right. uh, kitchen table. Well, I have one more quick question. Maybe it's a comment, but can you give me an, a, an example where the governor, you're, you're saying uh, he's holding the process up and yes, he hasn't agreed to the overall plan, but has he objected or somehow interfered with you putting the process in place as far as ordering the materials and the supplies and things that you need to and entering in contracts with the vendors? Um, has he done anything to delay any of that? There are some, and Will can speak to this, but you know, there are a number of things that we have been able to do and he has said, go ahead and plan for it, but we still have this decision looming over our heads. We've been unable to communicate clearly to the clerks and the public what the process is going to be. Contracts and as a vendor, I might be a little bit spooked if, if there's still a decision to come that might pull the rug out from under us. Um, so we're doing everything that we can, 
But having that uncertainty hanging over our heads and we just don't see the point of not making the decision now because the science and the data are not gonna tell us anything different in August than it's telling us right now. So we need to put this insurance policy in place right now, regardless of, you know, there's no point to us to wait another couple of months. So having that uncertainty hang over our heads has really just been, we feel like we're a bit hamstrung and we're a bit spinning our wheels, but Will can tell you what things we have been able to do, uh, but we really need to make a decision and, and, and be able to, to move ahead with certainty and with a clear path now. We're good. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Deputy Secretary of State. So, Will, if there is anything that's been said so far that you feel uh, you urgently want to clarify at this point, I would welcome you to jump in. But, um, but if not, uh, then I think we'll switch to Carol and uh, and hear her perspective as someone who uh, who administers elections on the local level. Nothing urgent, Madam Chair, and I'd love to hear from Carol. Thank you. Thanks for being with us, because I'm sure we will have nuts and bolts questions that come your way. Um, but Carol Dawes, since you are um, on the front line of, uh, of voting in a number of different election cycles, um, and also as a representative of uh, the clerks, why don't you give us your perspective on this plan to put a ballot in every Vermonter's hand? Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak. I've been following this. I, I listened to the, the Senate uh, um, debates uh, earlier in the week. Um, and one of the, the overarching points that I'd like to make is during that de debate, there was quite a bit of discussion about uh, senators hearing both pros and cons from uh, clerks. Um, and uh, and that's very true. There there have been um, uh, a lot of lively uh, discussion amongst the clerks, um, but the the concerns that have been voiced have to do with process and have to do with how this is going to be rolled out. And these are all questions that will be worked out with the Secretary of State's office. I personally haven't heard anything. Uh, from the clerks uh, that didn't uh, support the, the bill in front of you, which just uh, makes changes with regards to the governor's participation um, in the process. Uh, the body, the legislature has already approved mailing ballots to all voters as one of the options uh, that might be required for this year. Uh, and I think that uh, the clerks uh, look forward to working with the Secretary of State's office on the process. Um, this is, as uh, Chris Winters said, this is not anything new. Uh, I view it as just an expansion of a, a a situation that's already in place. Absentee balloting is already uh, a well, uh, a, a well functioning um, process available to voters. Um, and I think of it as just an expansion of that. We will certainly still have vote uh, voting in person. Um, Representative LeClaire, you talked about uh, Barry uh, town voting earlier this week. Um, and I think that, that that was a great example of how uh, a, a, a strong vote by mail, um, absentee voting can affect the number of people who come to the polls. Um, if I recall, it was while you had well over 2,000 people vote, there was less than 200 that actually came to the, to the drive-through polling that was set up. Um, and, and I think that by using, by expanding the tool associated with absentee voting, um, that we're, we're giving ourselves as many options as possible as we move into the unknown of where things are going to be in the fall. Thank you, Carol. Um, Jim Harrison has a question. Yeah, thank you, Carol. I'll make this quick. Um, you suggested that um, clerks move uh, approve, uh, support legislation. Are, are you suggesting that all town clerks support the plan to go to all mail balloting? 
No, I didn't. I didn't uh, suggest that. Um, as I said, there's been a, a fair amount of lively debate um, on the listservs uh, and email. Um, and there are clerks who are not in support of it. There are clerks who are very much in support of it. Um, but the, the discussions that have been had with regards to uh, the all uh, to mailing ballots out to all voters. Uh, the concerns voiced have been mostly around the processes involved, um, not about the whether it's appropriate or not to mail ballots to all voters. Most of it's been around the process. And I think that those are details that that the clerks will work closely with the Secretary of State's office on making sure that uh, that the right processes are put in place. Okay, thank you. John Gannon. Thank you, um, and thank you for testifying, Carol. Um, just a couple quick, well, one comment. I, I, as I think you said, this is really just an expansion of um, an election system that has been in existence for several years. Um, and and is, is your, your belief that most clerks are now very aware of what the Secretary of State's office is proposing um, and are, are starting to educate themselves about this? I certainly believe so. There, there has, uh, going back six, eight weeks ago, there was email uh, out from the Secretary of State's office to all clerks, keeping them up to speed as to what was being developed both for, for August, for, um, for November. Uh, and there has been uh, some increased outreach, uh, both from the Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association and from the Secretary of State's office to clerks over the last 10 days or so, um, which has provided even more information. So I think there's been uh, quite a bit of outreach uh, to clerks. Um, and, and I know they're also reading articles in the newspaper and reading Digger and that has led to the discussion. So I think there's been a, a lot of engagement um, with regards to clerks and, and, uh, and they certainly have the, the information available to them and are working on, already working on problem solving for in-person in voting and, and uh, different aspects of it like that. So, so we're all geared towards uh, the two elections still to come this year. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions for Carol? All right, Carol, I, I very much appreciate your thoughts and, and please stick with us in case we come up with other questions that would um, benefit the perspective of, uh, of a local elections administrator. Um, we have a couple of different uh, organizations with us today who would like to weigh in. And so I'm gonna go first to Greg Marshallden of AARP. And I would love it if you would share AARP's perspective on uh, mailing ballots. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and I'll, I'll be brief as well, but ARP Vermont supports this legislation because the state does need to take action to assure that all registered voters can cast uh, ballots safely this summer and fall. Here in Vermont, uh, voters over the age of 50 made up 63% of all voters in 2018 and 59% nationally. So people over 65 show up the polls far more often than any other age group would also note that many of our poll workers, many of the volunteers across the state are also retirees and over 65 as well. However, it is the same age demographic that is far more vulnerable to COVID-19 than younger ones. And we know that COVID-19 is killing older people around this country at a much faster rate than it is other age cohorts. Our elders know this and they are rightfully reluctant to go anywhere where there might be large groups or close quarters. We need to protect Vermonters votes and election officials and volunteers who staff polling locations, many of whom again are retirees. Uh, we also know that we are running out of time here to implement alternative means to cast a, for people to be able to cast a vote such as voting from home. And older Vermonters should not have to risk A, their lives or B, their health to exercise this very important right. ARP Vermont supports this committee and this legislation and encourages the state to take these steps to send absentee ballots to all registered voters in Vermont. 
This would be especially, again, helpful for many of the older folks in the state, but also specifically folks in long-term care facilities, folks in rehab centers, and folks that are quarantined due to the virus. And again, we're not sure uh, what that will look like in the fall, but by all predictions, we're pretty sure it will, be, it will come roaring back. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to share ARP's perspective. Thank you, Greg. Um, any questions from committee members? Great. Okay, so I would like to ask Kate Lapp uh, next to please share her thoughts with us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning. For the record, my name is Kate Lapp and I'm the Government Reform Associate at VPIRG, the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. And I'm here this morning to encourage you to pass S-348 as approved by the Vermont Senate. By now, I'm sure you've seen our petition calling for three things. First, mailing every voter a ballot. Second, keeping safe in-person voting options available. And third, expanding voter education and outreach. To date, this petition has been signed by over 2,500 Vermonters and 14 organizations. Uh, VPRIC supports S-348 for the following 10 reasons. First, safety. The American Public Health Association and the Vermont Public Health Association recommend voting by mail as a way to limit crowding at polling locations and reduce the risk of exposing voters and election workers to COVID-19. Second, convenience. COVID-19 and the governor's stay home, stay safe order are nothing if not an enormous inconvenience. Sending every registered voter their ballot is a small inconvenience the state should, small convenience the state should provide to people who are struggling. Third, flexibility. We simply don't know what the pandemic will look like in the fall and S-348 gives election officials and voters the options they want and need in November. Fourth, participation. Even in this moment of crisis, Vermont can still help more registered voters participate in our democracy and S-348 might increase turnout in this year's election. For example, we've already talked a little bit about the Essex Westford School District vote. Um, it held one of the first large scale vote by mail elections in Vermont um, earlier this week. Participation in that vote climbed from 934 last year to 4,968 this year. That's an increase of over 500%. That level of democratic engagement is something to celebrate. Fifth, this is tested. Millions of people already vote by mail in America and thousands in Vermont. The states of Washington, Oregon, Utah, Hawaii, and Colorado all have universal vote by mail programs. Elections officials from both parties in those states attest to the wisdom and security of these programs and recommend other states follow their lead. Sixth, predictability. Passing S-348 this month will allow election officials in the state and local levels time to educate voters about their new options. In that way, everyone can know what to expect when it comes to voting in November. Seven, this is common sense. The governor has amended rules and regulations to allow for the home delivery of beer, wine, and cocktails. If we can deliver these highly regulated substances, we should be able to safely deliver paper ballots. Eight, vote by mail is recommended. The nonpartisan elections experts in the Secretary of State's office and with the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association have recommended we do this transition to a vote by mail system. At a moment where we are taking the advice of experts on how to safely address the COVID crisis, let's follow the recommendations of these officials and experts on how to safely conduct this year's election. Nine, it's already paid for. The federal government has already provided the funds to conduct the 2020 election by mail. We are not asking Vermont taxpayers to fund this effort. 10, voting by mail is simple. The bill passed by the Senate is the good one. For the sake of giving election officials more time, as much time as possible to prepare for a vote by mail election, we ask that you pass S-348 in its current form as soon as possible. I'm really thankful for the opportunity to join you today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Kate. Jim Harrison. Yeah, Kate, thank you for joining us today. Um, do you have any recommendations for any changes in how ballots are able to be turned in in terms of mail ballots? Or, or do you support the existing law, which means by any means possible? That would be a policy decision that we would leave to this committee at this time. We encourage a swift passage of a clear bill, but we have not taken a stance on returning ballots beyond current existing statute. Would you, would you have any objection to narrowing who can turn it in like many other states do, um, such as the voter themselves, a caregiver, family member? Uh, and not allow for harvesting by interest groups uh, or candidates to collect ballots? Again, we haven't taken a position on that at this time. If it's a permanent 
change to Vermont's election law, we would encourage more time for a thorough conversation and investigation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members for Kate? All right, excellent. Thank you, Kate. Um, so we have two um, folks with us today from uh, the National Vote at Home Institute and Amber McReynolds and Audrey Klein are um, are both with us or they were both with us. Uh, Audrey, um, thank you so much for joining us this morning and um, uh, please help orient us uh, a little bit about what your organization is um, and then please share your thoughts with us. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Audrey Klein. I'm with the National Vote at Home Institute. Um, I, uh, Amber McReynolds sends her apologies. She's in a, in a board meeting for our organization today. So um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Our organization is a national nonpartisan 501c3 organization, and we orient around ourselves around the, um, the process of voting from home, um, which is uh, the combination of vote by mail policies, but also creating an ecosystem around it of policies that um, that help everyone vote. Um, we can see that not everyone um, finds voting at home to be the most convenient or possible solution. Um, there are some voters that don't have reliable mail access, um, such as uh, Native American populations, and there are people with um, that are differently abled. Um, that might need those in-person options, and we create a larger system that accommodates all of those. Um, does that answer your question, Madam Chair? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, I, I'm so pleased to be here. We're here to uh, support the bill. Um, and we also want to sort of, we will come from uh, a little bit more of the election official side. Um, we uh, generally agree with everything that has been said, especially from PERG. Um, but we also want to make sure that that we note that this kind of policy also helps elections officials deal with the, the sort of shifting sands of what this year's election is going to look like. Um, not only do we support the bill because it's necessary for public health, um, but it's prudent, it can be cost effective, um, and, and really sort of smooth out the way that the, the election is going to go this year. Um, we highly recommend proactively sending ballots in the way that the secretary has recommended um, and this bill um, allows for. Uh, that cuts out a lot of administrative burden on the town clerks. Uh, this year across the country, we're seeing a massive uptick in absentee requests. Uh, so some states have opted to do a bit of a half measure where they're sending absentee requests to uh, voters and then they have to be returned and processed and then you also have to then process ballots out. Um, it's causing um, some pretty large log jams and bottlenecks across the country and we don't recommend that process. We're much more in favor of, of what this bill is recommending. Um, furthermore, there's other administrative hurdles that this clears, um, including processing deadlines that will allow for um, uh, for continual processing of the ballots. Um, currently, law only allows the processing to begin a day before election day. And so opening up that process and allowing uh, clerks to just continually uh, work on those ballots as they come in uh, will smooth out the process and make things a little bit more cost effective and allow clerks to sort of uh, to plan their resources better uh, and make sure that they're, they're, they're putting the resources where they're needed. And, and in our opinion, we think that it's gonna be towards the mail balloting um, but giving them as much flexibility as possible is something that we do recommend. Um, with that, I will not take up much more of your time, but I would be pleased to take any questions, but also um, in the future, we want to be helpful. We're a collection of elections officials and experts across the country, and we've been doing this for a very long time. So we would love um, our mistakes and our, our, uh, our lessons learned um, to be your benefit. Thank you, Audrey. I appreciate it. Uh, committee members, anyone have questions for Audrey? All right. I am not hearing any questions. So uh, we have a few more minutes. I would open it up to committee discussion on, uh, on how we should proceed. Go ahead, Mike. 
<laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> we got you. you know, I, I'm just trying to unmute without dropping a word I don't want to use on. <laughs> um, well, thank you for your time and thanks for all our um, people who came in to, to work on this. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm ready to, to vote. I, I'm ready to concur with the Senate. Uh, I think this is an issue that has been kicked around long enough. The can has to stop kicking down, getting kicked down the road. Uh, the time to act was last month. And I believe uh, we, we have a fair plan in there that's just for this crisis time. We're not looking to change permanent law here. And uh, given those considerations, uh, I'm gonna move that we accept the Senate bill. Madam Speaker, I have my hand up. Sure do. We won't do anything before we've had a chance to have a, 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 a committee discussion about this. So thank you, Mike, for your, <laughs> uh, for your motion. And Rob, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't think anybody is debating whether or not this is going to happen. We've already given the Secretary of State the authorization to do that. This whole debate, uh, quite honestly, is around whether the governor should be involved in this process or not. Um, the Secretary of State very clearly said that he's looking for a clean bill, wants to move this thing through. I agree. So I'm not sure procedurally where you would like this to fall, but I would make the motion that we remove the governor, any reference to the governor in this legislation at all, out totally. Recognizing that, yes, it may have to go back to the Senate. There's nothing that says that we have to accept what they did or didn't do. Um, there's nothing in this legislation as it's currently reads that prohibits the Secretary of State or any of his um, staff from going ahead and pursuing this. This isn't a matter of whether or not it's going to happen. It's just a matter of whether or not the governor has has any involvement whatsoever. So that would be my motion is to remove him totally from any reference in this legislation at all. Thank you. Marcia Gardner. Either at the end of April or the beginning of May, we heard from the Secretary of State's office that time was of the essence, that we needed to move forward with a clear path for them. And as much as I would like to clean up the language in this bill, uh, I think we need to move ahead with it quickly and just pass it as is. Thank you. Other thoughts from committee members? Madam Chair. Yes, Bob. Can't figure out how to turn things on on the phone, but I concur with Marcia. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for agreeing to join us. Um, even though you're still out and about, I appreciate you making every effort to be here. Um, so we have, uh, we have two, uh, two different suggestions from committee members. And, uh, and um, since the suggestion that Mike made sort of negates the suggestion that Rob made. I'm going to ask us to act on uh, on Rob's motion first. Um, uh, but now I see Jim's hand up. So before we start taking votes, I will ask Jim, what, what can we do for you, Jim? Yeah, I think you just answered my question. I was just asking for clarification. Uh, if Rob made a motion to delete reference to the governor, um, we heard the secretary say that he didn't have a problem with that. Um, so I will support that. Thank you. Okay. So the first question at hand here right now um, is the question of um, removing the governor altogether. And uh, so Marsha, if you have a roll call sheet, um, I think I'll ask you to um, to take a roll of how committee members feel about uh, striking the all of the reference to uh, to the governor having involvement in this. And go ahead when you're ready. Can I ask a question before we begin? Absolutely. Um, based on this, 
Uh, this is probably for Betsy Ann. Betsy Ann, are you still on the call? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we can come back at a later date and clean up this bill and amend it as proposed by the representative from uh, Barrytown. Is that correct? You could do so until that time. It's provisions would stand if you were to enact it as is. So that, for example, there would be that requirement to consult and then if the decision is made to mail out the 2020 election ballots to inform the governor of the secretary's decision to do so. Thank you. Okay, uh, committee, any other discussion about, uh, about the question at hand? All right, Marsha, when you are ready. Okay. Gannon. No. Kitz Miller. Warren, are you there? Uh, I think Warren is doing his tutoring right okay. now. Okay. Merwicki. No. LeClaire. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Gardner, no. Classic. Yes. Cooper. No. Brownell. Is... No. Okay. Ha uh, Colston. No. Copeland Hansis. No. So we have seven, three, one. All right. Um... The motion before us at this point is, uh, oh, Jim Harrison, you have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I caught whatever the representative from Putney has, um, sorry. <laughs> um, I was going to offer an amendment to add some bumper guards uh, similar to what is in other states, um, but given the way that that simple amendment before me went, um, I'm going to not offer it. Um, I, uh, I, I Unfortunately, I was looking for a path forward to make this bipartisan uh, and I think um, we're going down the path of all mail um, sending out of ballots like the lack of restrictions that we have today and I was looking for a path forward and it seemed to me this morning that the secretary backtracked a little bit on uh, some provisions that he had proposed to the governor earlier uh, and I'm disappointed in that. Um, so I will be voting uh, no on this bill, uh, and I sincerely uh, had hoped that we could have ended up in a bipartisan. Elections are too important for one party to decide the rules, uh, and I feel very unfortunate uh, for that. Uh, I had suggested to you, Madam Chair, that maybe we get a different perspective from a uh, another town clerk, other than the city clerk in Barrie that supports all mail balloting. Everyone is entitled to their um, opinion. Um, and that didn't happen either. So I, I just, I'm very disappointed. Uh, I will be voting no on the motion to concur with the Senate. I did not come here to rubber stamp what the Senate does. I'm sorry. So I would just uh, remind the committee that the question before us right now is whether the Secretary of State can move forward with agreement with the governor or on his own as the elections administrator. And the question of whether to allow the Secretary of State to decide to mail ballots to every voter uh, was made uh, several weeks ago. Uh, we've already given the Secretary of State that ability to do that. So the, the only question before us right now is if we uh, remove the governor from the process as he has asked us to do. 
Um, and I am more than happy to continue to have conversations with the elections administrators, um, both at the Secretary of State's office and from the clerk's perspective uh, about the directives that will go out to educate the public on the legal ways within current law to return an absentee ballot. Um, but at this moment, I think we have uh, we've come to the point where we need to give assurance to the Secretary of State's office to move forward. So uh, any other committee discussion? All right, nobody's diving for their raise hand button. So I'm going to assume that we are ready to go ahead with um, considering Mike Merwicki's motion to concur with the Senate on S348. Are you waiting for a second? Nope. I'm giving Marsha a moment to, to, to fill out the form correctly so that she's able to keep very good track of the votes we're taking. I believe I am ready, Madam Chair. All right, take it away. Gannon. Yes. And Warren is still absent. Mowicki. Yes. McClare. Yes. Harrison. No. Gardner. Yes. Classic. Yes. Cooper. Yes. Brownell? Yes. Colston? Yes. Copeland Hansis? Yes. So we have 911. And the motion carries. All right. Um, Warren has. Um, has told us that he's off doing his tutoring and I don't know if he's been um, listening in on the YouTube, but he may pop back into committee before we uh, before we fully wrap here. So I'll just ask you to keep the vote open for a few more minutes. Um, and I want to say thank you to Audrey and Kate. And uh, did we already lose um, uh, our AARP guy, Mr. Marshallden? Um, and uh, thank you to the folks from the Secretary of State's office for being here and being available to answer our questions. Um, and uh, are there any other um, announcements or questions from committee members on what we're doing? All right, I will remind committee members. Well, first of all, I will say to committee members, I, there were a couple of you who reached out to me yesterday and um, I was literally back to back to back um, in meetings all day long, including sitting outside um, my nephew's drive through graduation ceremony, um, finishing up a call before I, before I went to his sixth grade graduation. Um, and so I apologize for not getting back to you, but I, I will do that um, today, make myself available today if, um, if, uh, if you have something you wanna chat about. Um, but the other, uh, the other issue that I need to get some input from you on, if you have some, is this question around um, the recommendation that our committee can make with respect to the COVID relief fund dollars. And so um, I will encourage you to hound me if you have some ideas, um, send it to me via email if it's something that you just want to get on my radar. Um, and by all means, if you, uh, if you have a plan that you think is good, feel free to reach out to other, um, other entities or organizations to, um, to, to do a little bit of legwork on it and see if you can get um, an idea more fully fleshed out. Uh, Warren, um, thank you so much for popping on and joining us. Uh, the question yes. before us is, um, is do, we, do you concur with the Senate proposal or the Senate um, S348? Has the Senate amended it? Uh, well, they sent it over to us as, as a bill. Um, as we heard Betsy Ann yep. uh, roll out right at the beginning of our meeting. Yep, so no, no changes. 
No changes. I vote yes. Okay, thank you. And if mm -hmm. you need to go back to finish your uh, no, tutoring session. No, I, I can stay for, what do we got? Three more minutes or yeah. something? Yeah. Yep. We were basically just doing some yeah. announcements. I just, I just signed off early with my student. Thank you. I very I much appreciate it. I figured that's what you were voting on. And I said, I really need to get to that one. Uh, Mike Merwicki has a hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank you uh, for your patience and perseverance to help us get through this, this issue here to, to get us on track with voting. I think we've made a lot of efforts to reach out uh, to the administration, to, to, to all parties here. And uh, we've been at this for months, literally. Um, and I appreciate the, again, the patience and perseverance you have exhibited in bringing us through this and, and getting us to this point here. So thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, this is all part of the important work of the uh, hardworking and talented Government Operations Committee. So um, I appreciate all your um, persistence and perseverance, and and very much respect that uh, that we came to this conversation with uh, with different ideas and different concerns. Um, and I think we can continue to discuss them because as we know, the ballots aren't going to be mailed until September. So we can continue to talk about how we, uh, how we educate the public and how we, um, and how we uh, encourage folks to return their ballots in, uh, in the legal ways. Uh, Warren is raising a hand. Hi, Warren. You gotta unmute yourself though. <laughs> I wanted to ask what the vote was on that question. Uh, the final vote with I'm you a was sorry about that. <laughs> the final vote with your vote was ten to one. Thank you. All right. So, COVID relief fund suggestions. Um, please feel free to reach out, and um, and otherwise, we should probably jump over to the floor at this point. Um, any other questions? All right, nobody's diving at the screen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Carol and Will and Chris and tell Jim thank you. And uh, Andrea, appreciate the help as always. See you all over on the floor.